Good afternoon and welcome to this new FBF online seminar. My name is Pierre Schlosser. I'm the scientific coordinator of the Florence School of Banking and Finance. And it's a great pleasure for me today to welcome you to our online seminar on AI and systemic risk. I'm very glad to welcome our lead speaker uh, today, um, Professor John Danielsons from the London School of Economics Systemic Risk Center. John, welcome. The topic of today is a very exciting one, artificial intelligence and systemic risk. We know that AI will affect all industries, and I must confess you that I thought for a moment that academia would be left unaffected, but reading an FT article this morning, uh, which was showing, by the way, that robots could become useful training assistants in just three hours, I'm starting to become worried about my job too. So job loss is part of the risk and threat dimension that each of us associate to the development of artificial intelligence. And of course, there are also numerous opportunities, however, and I look forward to discussing those opportunities also with you today. Um, in this context, let me say that it's a real pleasure again to be in the company of, of uh, John. Many thanks also to my colleague Jan, who has supported us in the setup. Before entering the fascinating discussion that we're going to have today, I'd like to inform you about our school's upcoming activities in just a few minutes. Um, as you will know, our school has a diversity of policy debate and training activities, meaning that our online seminars are only one of the numerous activities that we, that we run. For example, we released a few days ago our annual ebook uh, entitled European Financial Infrastructure in the Face of New Challenges, a quite broad uh, focus on the idea of the European safe asset, uh, talking about also debt restructuring um, and other issues which I invite you to have a look at um, by downloading the book. Also, on the 4th of November, we'll host uh, a new online seminar on lessons for central banking from the euro area crisis, and we'd be glad to have you back uh, in that occasion. Uh, during that same month, so next month in November, we'll have a course also on forecasting for banking using time series methods. That's going to be held here in Florence. Um, and um, talking about training, so on the slide that you will see now, you will see who typically attends our training courses. I'm very glad to inform you in this, uh, in the occasion that you missed that, uh, that we've recently opened our 2020 residential training courses for registration. Uh, so let me guide you through some of them in the next slides. Uh, we'll have uh, a course in February uh, 2020 on models for financial stability and prudential policy um, with uh, Jean-Charles Rocher um, amongst others. Um, we'll have also a course in March on panel data for banking sector analysis. We'll have a course later also in March on monetary policy transmission and a myriad of other courses earlier and later in the year that should be of interest on uh, anti-money laundering, on debt restructuring, on uh, other aspects such as MIFID II, and I miss many of them. You can find more details on our activities on our website. Okay, so I think it's a good time now to focus back at this uh, on the seminar to have a look at who's here uh, in the room. We have uh, close to 100 participants from uh, 64 nationalities represented. Uh, it's a pleasure to say that in terms of institutions and agencies represented and actors, we're really glad to count on several participants from the European Securities and Markets Authority in Paris, who is leading the race this time. Uh, the European Central Bank is also highly represented, as is the LSE the Single Resolution Board, the Commission, and a lot of uh, other actors, um, be it from the public and the private sector. In terms of gender, we have 42% of women and 58% of men. Um, we have also a majority, thin majority of trained economists, uh, plus lawyers. Some of you have a background in business. And lastly, we have uh, a majority of you who have a master's degree, um, but quite a good chair, also have a PhD and a bachelor degree. So as is uh, quite common in our online seminars, the way we will structure it is that Jan will uh, speak and deliver his, uh, uh, his presentation for about 25 minutes. 
following his presentation, we'll open up the Q&A session where you guys will uh, have a chance to come in and write your questions and comments in the chat box that will appear uh, in this second step. And I also should mention that uh, during the talk of uh, John, there will be a few polls which will appear on the screen. And I encourage you, of course, to have a look because this is a good way for you Hello, to share afternoon. your thoughts and your uh, your perspective. Fantastic. So good afternoon, everybody. Now, just to sort of make make it clear what I want to talk about is I am not here to discuss what is systemic risk and I'm not here to discuss what is artificial intelligence. There are plenty of other sources you can find on those topics. What I want to talk about is the intersection between the two. So how does AI affect systemic risk in the financial markets? Now, the, all of this work is done jointly with some co-authors. So, so just to make that clear, we have a paper that's available on SSRN, a paper that is joined with Andres Uteman, who is now at the Bank of Canada, and my, and my colleague in LSE, uh, Robert McRae. So you can sort of get the summarized version of what we are discussing from the SSRN paper if you are interested in more details. Now, where are we coming from with this? There's some problem with the slides here, sir. They're not, work they're not moving around as they should be. Ah, there are two people trying to control the slides, so therefore, ah. Okay, so the the system seems to have stabilized. Now, if you think about what artificial intelligence can and cannot do, so we have we had a lot of noise recently about how it's really good at defeating human beings in, in computer games and games like Go and Chess. Well, technically speaking, any game has a defined finite action space. And that means every outcome in a game is predefined. So any game where you know that you can find the finite number, there's an X number of outcomes or X number of games you can play in Go or Chess, human beings will always lose to artificial intelligence. Therefore, computer games, by definition, is something the AI will win out. The more the action space becomes ill-defined, and of course, everything to do with human beings is ill-defined, that is no longer the case. And the reason is, and that's a point I will make clear a little bit later on, artificial intelligence, at least as we have it today, cannot reason or think about things it hasn't seen. What it can do is it can generalize about a problem if given enough information, but it can't apply any experience from one part of humanity to another. And that means, unlike human beings today, it cannot understand the global problem, this is important, but it can understand the local problem really well. So if you take particular applications, if you take something like driving a car, medical diagnosis, credit allocation, a large number of other problems, the reason why AI is good at them is because we can map the global complicated problem into something that's contained, or we call a contained local problem. The more you can do that, the better AI will perform. And that distinction becomes crucial in how AI performs in the context of both macro and micro potential regulations in, what is, in what's about to come. Now, the second part of my talk is systemic risk. And to begin with, what is systemic risk? Systemic risk is, is defined by the financial authorities as the unlikely event that a financial crisis will cause a severe economic recession. And let me think about that for a sec, what it means, because there's a lot of misunderstanding about what systemic risk is. To begin with, it is not something you can ever eliminate. And the key reason is, Systemic risk happens always on the boundaries of the silos. We have silos, different regulatory institutions. We have, uh, uh, we have different financial institutions. We have different national boundaries. All of those means that where those silos meet, that's where crises happen. And if you take the frequency of them by the most common database on crisis, we have a systemic crisis one year out of 43, meaning that each and every one of you can ex expect to experience one twice in your lifetime. 
Second thing is to add to systemic crises is, by and large, they do not happen because anybody's individual behavior or they do not generally happen because of the failure of any individual bank. By and large, even the largest banks failing should not necessarily cause a systemic crisis. Now, how big are these things? If you take the United States, the biggest economy in the world, we are not looking at costs in terms of billions or tens of billions. Instead, a systemic crisis costs trillions of dollars in the context of the United States. It would do the same in Europe, and that means we might be talking 10% of GDP or more. If you have an event that is smaller, it is not really systemic. And keep in mind, it's almost axiomatic that a crisis happens when nobody is looking. Now, so what is systemic risk all about? Well, imagine the stock market today goes down by $200 billion. Well, I'm long the, the US stock market, I'm long the S&P, and I won't really care. In 2008, a potential and not even real subprime losses of less than 200 billion, and oh my God, it was almost like the world was coming to an end. How can a $200 billion loss in one domain cause all that damage and the same amount in another domain not cause any damage? Well, the reason is that the risk we know, we prepare for, or we can call it known unknown risk. That's the stock market. The risk we don't know is a dangerous type. And the unknown unknowns is what causes a crisis. That is what happened in 2008. And it is axiomatic that the next crisis is happening when nobody is looking. Now, what does artificial intelligence have to do with any of this? Imagine, imagine we, we get an AI, we can call it Bob. Bob is the Bank of England's robot or Bank of England bot. And we already seen quite a bit of discussion on AI as a financial regulator or a macro potential regulator or someone who decides on monetary policy. Imagine we use Bob for supervision. Well, he would be very good for the micro potential regulators. My contention is that he will not be so good for macro pro or systemic risk. Indeed, on the contrary, my contention is that he would be dangerous. So what are the areas where Bob is likely to perform well? Well, Bob is likely to perform really well in domains like risk management, compliance with regulations, and microprudential regulations generally. Now, I don't see any technological reason why artificial intelligence can't really play a major role and even take over most risk management functions in banks, and we are seeing major efforts in that. For example, just the basic task of risk modeling can almost in its entirety be outsourced to an AI. It's, it's a simple statistical model with plenty of data ripe for optimization. And the same applies to most microprudential uh, micro supervision. And therefore, my expectation would be that the job of the supervisor and the job of the risk manager becomes a higher level job than it is today. It will be more sub controlling the AI, controlling how they work, rather than uh, looking at minor details uh, themselves. Bob, by the Bank of England bot, bot, will talk to the bots in the other commercial banks. These bots will pass data. They will, uh, they will discuss models, rules, questions, and decisions. Now, Quite a bit of that is today, as you may know, the FSA in the UK already has a, has a bot interface for compliance. It's already computerized the rule book, and all of that is happening rapidly, as of course many of you will know. Why is it not happening? Well, the objections to this are cultural, they're political, and they are legal. In other words, they're not technological. But if you think about the economics of it, some high cost term investment in technology versus a very long term savings in human capital makes it an absolutely clear case. So given the financial case for AI in both micro potential regulations and risk management, I suspect that we will see a rapid adoption which, we, which will lead to a very significant change in the staffing and the type of work people do in this business.
Now, it is not as clear if you look at macroprudential regulations. Macroprudential regulations is all about systemic risk. It's all about financial stability. And there, there are significant limits to artificial intelligence can do. And the thesis I'm going to advance to you is that some of them can be overcome with technology, the others cannot. And the shopping list is reasoning, procyclicality, unknown unknowns, and optimization against the system. So here's what can go wrong with, uh, with macro pro. Take Bob. Bob is the Bank of England bot. So at the top there in the green box. And Bob is talking to his friends, Gus Mellonberry. Or the, if you want to put names on this, Gus could be Goldman Sachs, Men, Mel could be Morgan Stanley, and Barry could be BlackRock. They're all talking, talking to each other. They're all passing information both between them and also to, to, uh, to Bob. Question is, what does that interaction do to systemic risk? Well, let's put a little bit of, of a structure on what systemic risk is. Now, and it's useful to think about the frequency of event and severity. The most frequent events that happen daily, we are talking about things like client abuse. They are mostly about banks saving money. They are mostly about profits. And they're easy for Bob to do. It's easy to measure risk. Now, what about big losses? Well, big losses, they happen infrequently. Put a number on it, once a decade, we can debate the specifics. They're about idiosyncratic bank risk. Bank failures become even less frequently, right? Maybe one, maybe every two decades or so. They're not, they don't happen very often, even less than that. That is systemic risk as we see it. Now let's take it to a more severe events, the once or two events a century. That's a global banking crisis. That's a, and the, the drivers of big banking crisis are predominantly the macroeconomy not anything happening in the financial system. And if you take the worst crisis, the global systemic crisis, the key driver of events is politics. That is, the, the, if you take uh, populism, Trump, desire for a particular market structure, political press, preference for some type of regulations or some type of bank or whatever, whatever, is the political pressure that drives most long-term risk. And that is what gives problems for AI. So the shorter term the problem is, the better AI does. The longer term the problem is, the harder it is for AI to do anything. Now, to give an analogy to it, in the 1980s, a well-known AI called Eurisco was asked to play a naval war game. Well, the AI found that the best solution to fighting was to sink its own slower ships. Now, why is that? Because you're slowed down by your slower ships, you sink them, and you will win. Well, the problem is, of course, for the AI, this is obvious. For a human being, this is unacceptable. So the reason is a human being can think about the reason about things it hasn't seen, but AI cannot. It will only do what it you tell it. And therefore, and also, we can if you hire somebody to run macro pro or micro pro or whatever, you can ask them how they plan to, how they would cope with hypothetical scenarios. So you can ask a human being how it reasons, how it comes to its conclusions, how it draws on its personal experience. So my contention is the more important decisions we need to make, uh, more important decisions we delegate to AI, the more we need a kill switch to prevent it from doing something catastrophic, that is to stop the AI. And here's a hypothetical scenario. Imagine we have a crisis, and imagine Gus decides that it is prof the AI in Gus decides it's profitable to attack Barry and Mel. Well, that's a profit-maximizing behavior, and Gus might even be so aggressive as to attack Bob, the Bank of England. But the AI might decide that such an attack is profitable, but would any human being in the in these financial institutions make that decision? And I suspect the answer is no if only because they will be prosecuted afterwards. How do you prosecute an AI for misbehaving? You can't because to begin with, AI is not a legal person. So therefore there are constraints on the human beings who do not have an AI. The second reason is pro-cyclicality. 
Bob will favor Bob will favor homogeneous processes, homogeneous regulations. Bob will use best of breed methodologies, and he will like standardized processes. And I suspect even much more strongly than, than his human counterparts in the in the financial regulatory institutions. That inbreeding and that homogeneity models and approaches will make the behavior of financial institutions being regulated more procyclical, and that in turn will increase systemic risk. And furthermore, Bob cannot find unknown unknowns. Now, the, so my contention early on was that systemic crisis they have they are all about the unknown unknowns. The vulnerabilities happen on the responsibilities of uh, the silos on the boundaries of the silos. The typical example everybody gives is subprime mortgages put into structured credit products with uh, hidden liquidity guarantees crossing multiple jurisdictions, categories of institutions and countries. Nobody had nobody could see it all, and nobody in the current system can see it all. But that's how systemic crisis happen when nobody is looking, neither a human being or AI. You can train an AI on events that have happened. You cannot, but perhaps you can train it on something that can be imagined. But remember, one thing to keep in mind, the financial system is not only infinitely complex, it is endogenously infinitely complex. You can ask yourself, does any participant in the system, in the private sector, regulatory agency, or academia, have a financial incentive to reduce simplicity? And I say no. And we will always miss the unknown unknowns. And that is why Bob cannot do his job properly. Now, then, of course, we get the optimization against the system. Optimization against the system means that as a hostile entity in the financial system, you take advantage of the rules you have, you take and, and you take advantage of the system to profit. Now, the computational problem for the hostile agent intent on optimization is easier than that of any regulatory agency. And that is not a problem you can solve with any technology whatsoever, because if you find if you have an infinitely complex system, all you have to do is to find one weakness somewhere. And you can exploit that weakness with relatively low technology. The human regulator needs to find every possible weakness. They have to guard against the entire system, and they can't do that. Neither can the, neither can the AI or nor a human regulator. Now, there is, however, a difference between an AI doing this and a, and a human being, because a person they are random in many ways. Depends on what side of the bed you get on. You're in good mood or a bad mood. You use nuance, you interpret, and those interpretations are slightly random. They have common sense. They understand constraints that are not defined within the problem you're doing. They understand what, what are the limits of regulatory powers. They understand the political domain. For, for AI, all of that has to be programmed in, and if you don't, and therefore, therefore it cannot react, and that is what makes the AI less effective in dealing with optimizing against the system. So if you want an AI to be effective for macro potential regulations, it has to be able to exercise control across border. It has to be able to exercise control like across the silos in the system. It has to share data across borders and silos. Now, and of course, optimization against the system. When I ask people in the, in the IT business, how do you deal with optimization? And they say, okay, you're driving a Tesla car on the highway, and you know it's a Tesla, you know it's predictable and safe, therefore you can take advantage. You can, you can, you can beat Tesla in the traffic because, just because it's an AI. The way Tesla deals with it is it randomizes. It makes the AI driving a car on the highway random in some ways. The problem is, and that's a standard response in all of the AI literature, how do you deal with manipulation and optimization against it? Well, you can't do that in a regulatory domain because you cannot write into the system randomized responses. You cannot write in rules that are created non-transparently because it's legally and ethically unacceptable. Now, so therefore, the first five reasons for, for the requirements for an effective AI, the first five are unacceptable. 
What about the rest? Well, it, A, I have to understand causality in unforeseen cases, reason up globally rather than locally, identify threats it hasn't seen, and at least for the any foreseeable future, an AI cannot cope with any of that. So to summarize, Bob and his friends uh, and other regulatory agencies will become increasingly useful to the micro pro regulators, to the risk managers, they will reduce cost, they will change the job of the supervisor significantly. Meanwhile, they will increase systemic risk, they will reduce volatility in the system, they will fatten on the tails, that is, you get short term stability Thank you so and long term uh, risk of extreme outcomes. Thanks a lot. This was really, uh, really, really case, interesting. And I think you, you covered a lot, uh, that, a lot of finished. ground, uh, leaving very good chances of very good questions uh, coming in. Uh, before that, maybe we could engage with the, the various questions. Uh, so we've gathered results and responses on three questions. Uh, which uh, my colleague Jan will now put in the, the chat box uh, so that we can have them again um, uh, for all of us in front of us. Um, so would you like, uh, John, to engage with the first question? It's interesting that so the, the most of the audience today come from supervisory agencies. Yeah. And most, most of them do agree with me that the AI will significantly improve the effectiveness of the supervisory agencies strongly, almost 40 to 36 percent. And somewhat agree most of the rest. So you clearly recognize the impact AI will have. Now, what about the job specs of the supervisor? And you also see a similar view, not quite even more strongly, that the supervisor of the future has to become an AI expert. So they have to know the legal domain, they have to know the accounting domain, they have to know the whatever domain they have, but they also have to know AI. So that means the you need, and, and, and we can see what's, how, how this will affect the labor market because we're seeing AI removing jobs in increasingly low tech professions. What this is suggesting is that, uh, my contention is the AI will take off the low tech jobs in risk management and the supervisory agencies, and therefore the people running this, uh, running that in the future will be higher level employees with a better skill set, better trained, most likely better paid. So therefore, of course, we start seeing input on the labor market and other things. So there are this very much plugs into the social, social changes from technology and robotics we are seeing. Now. Also, you could say somewhat, I mean, on this, just uh, to stay on this question too, the majority of people say somewhat agree, meaning that in my expectation, uh, they would think that, you know, every micro and macro supervisor of the future would need to be somewhat expert in AI. And the question which I think would be interesting is, you know, what type of expertise would you would we or would you expect them to to have in in artificial intelligence? Is it you know do they need really to be trained at the level of engineers or do they need to understand what's what the robots are doing to to control them in a way? I mean I, mean, I would suggest to anybody who are planning on a on on a career in this field is to have. I mean, of course, they're not going to be experts in AI because because they'll be using the experts AI to design the systems. But they need to know what is machine learning, what is machine learning doing, how does machine learning feed into AI, how do typical AI algorithms works, what are the systems, so that so that at the very least they can have an intelligent conversation with whoever is designing the systems, and therefore they can also say because they can also make suggestions to, to their employees, this is where the fruitful to employ AI in what capacity, so they can guide the process. And I think that, I think the successful employer, employee of the, of the future agencies will be someone who can have, who's not an AI, a expert in AI, because that's not what you need, but they need to have, be able to have a conversation. And if you take, for example, most people in a business like this, you can talk about statistics, you can talk about finance, you can talk about macro pro monetary policy. It's a skill set you have. You're not an expert in it, but you're conversant in it. So being yeah. conversant in AI, AI, I think, becomes critical to, uh, to the skill set of anybody working in this business in the future. That's very good advice. Thanks. Uh, so for question three, I was interrupting you. Well, so I, question I, three was about 
financial really, regulation. Yeah. I'm really and happy that you answered to question three because it says in the kill switch. Right. And, and, and of course, we can all imagine a cyborg of the future. And you're sharing with me the danger that if you leave an AI in controlling a critical system, we cannot trust the AI to do its job properly. So, this, so therefore, somebody will have to be able to tell it to stop doing the job. Not much to say about that, but let's go to the next one. The will AI increase systemic risk? Now, there you are split. You are sort of, you sort of, the majority seems to think uh, AI will increase systemic risk, which is my contention, but you're much more uneven on that. So therefore, of course, the, the and, 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 and because this, this is not nearly as well understood, because it's all about the question, how effective does AI come in the various aspects of macro policies? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised by your, uh, by, by why you are not nearly as clear about your views on this question. But I suspect this last question before will become very crucial in the debate about AI in, 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 the, in, in, in the coming years. Okay. And so before we take on the questions which are coming up um, now, and I encourage our participants to, to write on, um, what's, because we're talking about the future use of AI, you know, for mainly micro pro and macro pro, what's a starting point? Uh, currently in, in Europe that you see? Is it like much more widespread in micro pool or and, and less in micro? In macro? What's the sort of data uh, constraints that you would also expect, I guess, if if you are on the macro side or on the micro side? I mean, I'm, I, I would expect the, the AI to be much, much more prominent on the micro side. I mean, micro is a well-defined domain. You know more or less exactly what your objective of the regulations are, you have the data and you know how to do your job properly, whether you're a risk manager or a micro pro supervisor. We don't even agree on what micro pro is. I mean, I mean, I mean, you can go to the same regulatory agency and they will give you 10 definitions depending on which, which part of the website you land on. But if you can't define micro pro properly, we don't know what data we need, we don't have the data. So micro pro is still very much ill-defined. So, so I would expect the entry of AI into this comes very strongly via AI, we see how it works there, we see how it copes with data, and then it moves up to macro. Okay. Okay, very good. Let us get started with the, with the question. So, we have a question from Mathieu who says, Hi John, according to you, which is an aspect of risk management where AI will be most useful? I can, so if you had to pick up one part of risk management. I can tell you what I think is going to be first most useful in risk modeling. So AI yeah. will be it will be really you. I just, this is also happening. If you follow what banks are doing, you know this is happening. You can probably take almost every position a bank has today, whether they create new positions or not, and you can model the risk in that without any human being doing any of that and get other risk estimates. So you should be able to take positions and data and have the AI figure out what is the regulatory whatever measure of risk you use. So that's certainly Certainly is the is the first part, and we have we have seen this happening very rapidly. Okay, very good. Then um, one of the big risks in the financial system, a question by Anna Maria. One of the big risks in the financial system are the risks coming from shadow banking. Uh, according to your presentation, AI will not be able to improve the risk assessment of the shadow banking. If you if you disagree. With with a restatement, uh, feel free to say it. There are other ways in which AI uh, can be used to better understand the shadow banking, and that's a question. I mean, the, the I, I agree and disagree, because the question of shadow banking is complicated. And if you take the European Capital Markets Union, that wants more shadow banking, because there was different ways of doing intermediation. So we can't, we can't condemn shadow banking in, in, in such a universal way. What AI can do, I think even quite effectively, you can take the data being generated by institutions reporting and give the authorities much better view of what is happening outside of the traditional banking sector. So it will provide more information to the authorities, regardless of what you think about the shadow banking sector otherwise. Okay. 
Um, a question from Mirko who is saying, what about the use of unsupervised learning to address the problem of unknown unknowns? Can't do it. Because, I mean, I mean the, so if you do unsupervised learning, you are feeding into a computer a large number of data, asking the computer to find patterns. Well, if something hasn't happened before, the computer won't see it. So therefore, and remember, the computer cannot reason outside of the boundaries. So therefore, this is an area where human beings have, have distinctively advantage because I can probably ask most of the people in the room, I can give them a scenario and they can think the scenario through much better than any AI can. So no, basically, unequivocally, no. But some, some learning is going to happen, no? Well, the learning how... happen, but the word unsupervised learning, meaning you throw a bunch of data into a computer and the computer tells you what the world is. That is unsupervised learning. Well, the, you need structure. And so I'm, a, I'm an economist and I think economic theory has a very significant role in this because the role of theory is to provide discipline. It gives you some rigor in how to think about problems. If you do statistical analysis or econometrics, you are guided by theory. So you need abstract thinking outside of the data domain to, to, give, to give structure. And therefore, unsupervised learning is almost like giving someone access to a statistical software data, telling me what the world is without teaching them economics. I mean, you'll get something out of it, but are you going to like the outcome? OK, there are more questions coming in. So a question from Samo, who says, just to be clear, you say random behavior cannot be programmed in AI because it would be morally, legally unacceptable, or because it would be impossible from a technical point of view. No, no, it's easy to do. I mean, there's no problem. I mean, you can program it in, certainly. I mean, the, the, to, to be, let me give a little more flavor to this, because this is important in misunderstanding about using AI in a supervisory domain. If you ask an engineer or a programmer about how you do AI, they all talk about randomized responses. They all talk about hidden rules. They all talk about, you know, they're basically emulating human irrationality in the AI. And then you, if you then go and talk to the lawyers in your regulatory agency and you ask the lawyer, can we within the, the legal structure of my country, can I ask deliberately programming randomness and non-transparent rules. And I can tell you what the lawyer will tell you, no. I mean, unequivocally, you cannot do that uh, uh, legally or even ethically for that, uh, or even ethically. So that, the, the reason is legal and ethical, not technical. No, I think the, the example you use about sinking the ships and de facto killing all the people on the ships was uh, very telling. Um, Jean-Jacques Van Helden. Hi, Jean-Jacques. I think that a he says, I think that AI is still an assistive technology to help suggest strategies and probabilities of outcomes, but that human expertise and driving a risk culture will remain preeminent. I mean, I, mean, I, I agree what? with this statement, but we, yeah. the, the point of this discussion is not talking about what is AI today, right? because we know what AI can do today, but exactly, it does assist it's providing a low level assistance to technically minded people working in banks or supervisory agencies. I'm thinking about where is AI heading? And just the one distinction between the AI technology that exists today and the AI technology being used today, there's a very big gap. Both banks and supervisors are low level users of AI compared to many other, dem or many other domains. And that will change rapidly. So, and, and the question is, you can, you can always ask yourself, is there's almost a step. First you say, okay, AI, take some data, give me, tell me what the, what's in the data. So the AI tells you that. And then you say, one year later, AI, give me a suggestion. And then, okay, you have a suggestion about a decision. And then, I, then you can say, okay, well, AI, can you make a decision, but I might overrule it. And then two years later, I trust the AI, you decide. And so there's a, that is a yeah. process, and we are still in the early steps of that, but we are moving along very rapidly in that direction. So you're saying it's a slippery ground? Well, slippery is a negative. I don't want it, it, it but this is the way things progress. And I mean, you, you know exactly how this is. I mean, you don't need an AI to go through this logic. You hire an employee, 
you give them a basic task, you start trusting them, you give them, a, you trust them more and more, eventually they make decisions. They're no, it's no different with an AI in that, in that respect. Yeah. Okay, a question by Christoph, who says, I like the link you make between systemic risk and the unknown unknowns. That view probably supports further integration of the risk frameworks used to manage systemic risk and emerging risk. Would that be a fair statement? The answer is yes, but I really worry about it. The, so the question, the problem with risk frameworks is they give us a view of the world. And it makes us, the danger is you say what's in the risk dashboard or risk framework, that's the world. What's outside of it is irrelevant. So I worry about the more you formalize risk frameworks as a way you're thinking about it, you exclude the rest of the rest of the system because you become excessively formal. So I'm, I'm sort of, and that is one danger from AI because it's very formal in, in, in how it approaches things, only looks at what you can see. So I'm concerned. Okay, thanks. A uh, question by Chiara, who is saying, uh, still on unknown unknowns, can these be negative tail events and therefore predictable, although in very low statistical probability? Okay, so some of you may know that I've done a lot of work on extreme value theory. This is all about finding extreme tail events. And my answer to that question is no. I do not think that you can take a distribution of outcomes map find uh, some tail probability or tail quantum and say that's a useful guidance to the future and the reason is that human beings so the, the way we call it is we say risk is either exogenous or endogenous exogenous risk is risk that comes from outside the system imagine an asteroid hitting the city of london we have a bad outcome happening we did nothing to make it happen endogenous risk is created created by the interaction of the human beings that make up the system and human beings change all the time. So therefore the statistical regularity you depend on to use something like extreme value theory or other techniques of that type, in my view, they don't provide a useful guide that's actually the opposite. They lead you the wrong, into the wrong direction. Okay. So we'll take three more questions and then we'll reassess in terms of timing. Um, a question by Anki, who was saying, hi John, thanks for your presentation. To make an analogy with chess, we've seen that human plus computer beats the field, including supercomputers. Do you think that we can find such a combination in macro proof? It's a very good question. And because what has happened in chess, just to iterate on the question is, while a, while a computer beats a human, a human working with a computer beats the computer. So it's a human, because the human, you combine the human insight with the sharpness of the AI chess playing technology. And I think this is very much how we will see macro pro evolve, much more than micro pro, is that you will see human beings work with an AI to improve on the supervisory function. So this, this is, I mean, I, I very much agree with your statement. Okay. Um, good. A question by Maria. Hi, John. Do you see any room for implementing AI in stress tests, especially those for macroprudential purposes? Well, there are two different answers to that. And of course, that will happen. I mean, the, the, it's inevitable that AI will plug into the macro stress testing environment. The, the, that's already happening, as many of you know. But is it going to be useful? It's a different matter. My existential doubt about macro proof stress tests is that they capture the known unknowns. They don't capture the unknown unknowns. So macro proof stress testing is one of these things that tends to give us a false sense of security. Because if you pass a macro proof stress test because you pass the scenarios thought out by somebody, you are safe. And so I worry about this increased formalization of the macro proof function of the stress testing is one. But the basic premise of the question, of course, AI will be increasingly useful. And one area where it will be useful, I suspect, is in the data, because you can start take all the data reported into, into the supervisory agencies. AI will put structure on that and therefore allow the designers of stress tests to make much more accurate stress tests within the domain. So the answer is certainly yes. Okay. Um... 
Then there was a question by Jorge on what data would use the AI? Could, um, could we find huge difficulties with no homogeneous data sets from financial institution countries, non-financial companies, also difficulties for the access to the data because of confidentiality issues? Well, these are two different questions. Let's do the technical bit first, which is easier. Yep. And of course, as many of you know, there's a big problem in, in how data is recorded. You have the different institutions, different divisions, labeling it differently using different databases, different structures of data, with different formats. I think this is what the question is all about. And at the moment, we need human beings to, to, to unify that. And I think this is an area where AI will be very fruitful very early. It will be able to take data which is sort of, sort of you can call it the labeling problem. It will take data that has the same information but with different names and give it a common name and common structure. That's, a, that's exactly a prime job for AI. The legal aspect, well, it's a legal aspect. It has nothing to do with AI, so outside of the domain, I think, of this presentation. Okay, so we have um, a bit of time and two more questions coming up. Um, one by Elena, who says, on risk modeling, scenario and governance, could AI be used on the predefined assessment of embedded management action of post-stress position of local, okay, of local reaction and extrapolated for global crisis prevention? If you understand the question, could you please reframe it first? I think I understand the question. So the, the, the question is, I think it's all about contingency planning or wargaming. So you have I mean, I might be wrong on it, but I'm just interpreting here. So yep. imagine you have a big stress event. You have a crisis coming or your bank is failing or whatever is happening so that you know how to react optimally. You pre-plan for how you react in a stress scenario. And therefore, and your work is called work gaming, which we know that the regulators run, do, do regularly, banks do it regularly. Of course, if I understand it correctly, AI is super useful in doing that because you can have an AI define a particular stress outcome and, and then you can see how the human beings in charge react to that. So I, if I understand it correctly, AI is really useful in that domain. Okay, and thank you Elena for this tough question. So Pedro, uh, can AI find new forms of market manipulation? So we're going beyond the realm of micro and macro pool. What about algo AI interactions and tacit collusions? Absolutely. The, the, the my, question, my topic, which I did only did briefly in my presentation on optimization against the system, and the paper is discussed much more, in much more detail. It's all about mm -hmm. how a hostile agent plays with the rules. Market manipulation is a very much part of that. So you could certainly see, and we talk about this in the paper, you could see how AI is in different... So take, for example, the trade, like I, I carry trade, being a simple example. In a carry trade, you collude, and then you jump out at the same time. But you need collusion to make the trade work or the manipulation work. The AIs can certainly manipulate, they can, and they can possibly do that in a way that's completely undetectable. So a part of the optimization of the system is the AI will be much more effective in playing games against the supervisory structure than any human being can today. Okay, um, question from Nigeria, and perhaps it's a good closing question because it brings us uh, beyond economics. So Orufemi is asking, I'm a lawyer based in Nigeria, how do I leverage AI and data science in my professions? I think we could extend to the legal financial law profession. I'm, I'm, I mean, I think one of the most interesting questions about AI is the legal dimension, because we, as an economist, we, have a, we think in terms of what you can do, <coughs> and a computer scientist thinks about what, they, what technology can do. The lawyers talk about what is allowed and not allowed in the society of humans outside of that. So therefore, therefore, of course, AI becomes really useful for uh, most lawyers. I mean, the, there's a lot of discussion about uh, the to what extent will AI change the legal profession. My understanding from talking to my legal colleagues is that quite significantly, because quite a lot of basic legal work can be outsourced to a computer, and therefore that is changing the profession rapidly. 
And my understanding is that the best law departments in the world are increasingly looking at teaching AI and machine learning as a part of the basic teaching packages. So if I, if I was a lawyer, especially a junior lawyer, I would jump on AI basically, absolutely with both feet rapidly. I would learn AI techniques. I would learn machine learning because that would be quite fundamental to how you practice law in the future. This is be my, and this is a, this is something I hear from my legal colleagues as the future of that profession, but it's outside of my domain of expertise. Yeah, no, but I, it, it's interesting to see the connections here. Um, great. So I think uh, we are getting very close to the end of this this seminar. I see that someone is still typing, um, but perhaps I perhaps I just ask you, uh, John, for for a concluding word. Um, what's uh, what have you learned from this discussion? Well, what I've learned is that the, 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 the interesting thing is how you responded to the quick questions I gave you and also the questions that you see. My feeling is that the, the audience, that is the audience that participated, they see the issues in a similar way as I see them. They are concerned with the same things. So, so the concerns about how AI will change the profession of risk management and micro macro pro regulations and the practice of economics for that matter is 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 important and just to conclude i i would encourage anybody especially those starting out in a career in i in either as an economist or a lawyer in the field of regulations or in micro macro pro is to put a pretty heavy ai machine learning component into the training regimes because my suspicion is that that will become important in the in in in, in the future development of these careers now the question of course is this is a very different question is how does this affect the macro prudential domain and there's one thing we haven't touched about but this is monetary policy i was in a conference in in a central bank recently where the topic was ai as a central banker and i think the the, the central bankers are thinking about that increasingly so how does central banking as a function including monetary policy get affected by AI. So we are still in the very early days of this, but there will be certainly rapid changes in the future. Yes, that's a very good concluding note. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you to all uh, our participants, um, in particular those who've contributed with questions.